Think about this. Imagine yourself in a class's world with no confining boundaries, no structure. It's in, it is encased in liberty, freedom, autonomy, choice. The world as we know it is becoming more globalized and interconnected. And although we might think this leads to many upsides and a more beneficial, leveling, and inclusive society, there are also many hidden unknown injustices. One of the most prominent being inequality and its escalation at an alarming rate. Perhaps the answer to this seemingly unsolvable question is to start back at the beginning of time, to ask ourselves whether inequality has been inevitable since man first set foot on Earth. Now, in order to answer this question, think back to your own past experiences of memories when you were younger and when looking at the word childhood. I think most people typically have one, two, or maybe a couple memories that they think of when thinking back to the times when you were younger. For me, one memory that always stands out was when I was younger and I was visiting my family in South Africa for Christmas once again. Christmas was always a time where we, we, where we would reunite with the whole family, with all of my 50 cousins. Now, a lot of people have left South Africa, and I could see this even in my own family. Me, my sister, dad, and I were at the time in the UK. My other sister was in Dubai, and my other auntie was in Australia. We were spread over different continents and in different places we had made a home to. In order to do this, we had to change and adapt the day that we had to change and adapt the we had to adapt and change the way we normally live our day-to-day -day lifestyles. I often like to think that the world is made up of 195 different planets. What I mean by that is, whichever country you go to is vastly different from another. Sometimes you have to change your original appearances, your day-to-day -day lifestyles, your original traditions in order to fit in with a new society and environment. It can be hard to keep your cultural roots in another country that has different ways of life and traditions. It is ultimately the society that we live in that governs how we think, live, and ultimately operate. Now, going back to this memory, a lot of, as I was saying, a lot of people had left South Africa, and I could see this even in my own family. But then I began to ask myself the question of why were so many of us leaving at an increasingly rapid rate, leaving a country and a nation we were so fiercely proud of? Why were so many of us leaving even if it was the opposite of what we wanted to do? South Africa, a beautiful country and a culture envied by many, why would anyone want to leave? However, when it comes to something you have to do and having to leave without much choice, the ball game changes. Now, the, to ask the question why, the most obvious answer to this would be just like any other person leaving their country. To seek for better job opportunities, excel career-wise, and overall live a better quality of life than the one in their current country provides. With the world becoming more globalized and interconnected, with international markets happening on a massive scale, leaving one's country in search of something more profound is now an option. We all want stability, and perhaps we choose to leave for it. Another way to determine the mass number of emigration in a country is to look at the environment and climate within that country. And for South Africa, one, one of the greatest factors to this was income inequality. I was shocked to see when I typed into Google that it was actually South Africa that was the top country for the greatest income inequality. The top country for income inequality, said The Guardian to my surprise, where the top one-tenth of one percent um, owns, owns almost 30 percent of the country's wealth more than double what the 90, bottom 90% owns, the country with the highest Gini index at 63. Now, we all know that inequality exists, right? I mean, it's hard not to. It's everywhere you look and go. But then I began to ask myself the question of whether inequality is inevitable. Now, if you look at the Google definition of inevitable, its meaning is a state to, be, to happen, unavoidable. So do we have to go look back to when mankind was first created to assess whether it is certain to happen? Or do we have to look at mankind's nature to assess whether it is unavoidable? As well as this, it is also important to consider what type of inequality you're looking at. Ethnicity, income, gender, etc. Well, I'm first going to begin with the idea that throughout history, there's been no proven case and no proven system that has eliminated all inequality. Spanning from the cavemen to the Romans all the way to the Victorian era, inequality has persisted. So is this to mean the birth of mankind introduces the birth of, birth of such inequality? However, with saying this, we can also argue that in inequality is a social construct. That is not inevitable, it's engineered. 
The Guardian states, that unless we wake up to the fact that wild inequality isn't just an unavoidable byproduct of growth, the gap will just keep on widening. What I really think the moral of the story that comes with this statement is that unless we as a human race stop believing that inequality is inevitable, its gap will just keep on widening. But although technological changes and globalization can act as unstoppable forces towards income distribution, it's not only these market processes that account for the continued range in income inequality between countries. After all, some of the most technologically advanced countries are the ones that are the most equal. Just as how we as humans are causing the planet to get warmer, the same can be said for wealth inequality, that these things are man-made. But on the other hand, does this mean as long as humankind exists, inequality exists too? Or does this mean we have the ability to seize it? Well, I'm first going to, well, what if we look deep into this, what if we delve deeper into this question? To look at countries whose actions are leading to a decrease in inequality. For example, by looking at the Gini index, countries with a low index. For example, look at Slovenia, countries that has in implemented the labor market and activation policies. Policies that are, that are designed for the unemployed to step up their job search after an initial spell of unemployment. Slovenia has also institutionalized the many rights of workers and created its own variety of socialism. Perhaps the solution to our problems today could be a mix of capitalism and socialism, a firmer approach to tax. Although the, the main difference in income inequality between countries is due to political factors, here being policy, the importance of scrutinizing policy and to help, importance of scrutinizing policy to help protect its citizens from poverty and forming improvements. But although technological changes and globalization can make it seem that inequality is inevitable in today's modern world, and that inequality is a social construct, it is not only these, it is these countries here come as a symbol of hope that inequality is able to be reversed and limited, even in capitalist societies. Going back to the Guardian once again, when we talk of neoliberalism, we're talking about something that has fueled inequality and has enabled the 1%. That tax and the climate we live in has enabled for such inequality to occur. If we have the ability to create something, don't we also have the ability to change it? Currently, there are 7.89 billion people in this world today. And over 47% live under the US dollar 6.85 poverty line. The first step to understanding inequality is to take a look around you and understand people like me and you are in fact the anomalies of this world, that we live in the top 5%. A life we might find ordinary is in fact a very small majority to a vast percentage that lives, lives without basic amenities. We have to understand the power that we hold, that we can be drivers for change. As a final note, we can take a page out of philosophy. Functionalist theories believe that inequality is in fact desirable and then plays an important part in society. We can view the question through the principle of fair inequality. Inequality that is appropriately connected to individuals' own responsible choices are fair. For example, some positions in society require more training and therefore should receive more rewards, where social stratification leads to meritocracy based on ability. And the principle of unfair inequality. Inequality that is not appropriately connected to individuals' own responsible actions. For example, inequality that is passed down through generation through generation through an environment of services and opportunities. So it is looking here that we can also view inequality through whether it is fair or unfair, where it's passed through a generational cycle. So perhaps it is indeed possible to stop unfair wealth inequality using the principle of fair inequality. The world as we know it has always been on a fight for self-sufficiency, Perhaps now we have to look at the idea of self-sufficiency as a collective and not independently. Going back to The Guardian once again. Inequality is not in inevitable, it's engineered. And just like the problem of global warming, we have the ability to become self-sufficient and change the climate we construct. Thank you.